Uh, we're going to get started with the last session before lunch. Uh, we're going to do Unicode and Python completely demystified. Uh, it's presented by Kumar McMillan. Kumar McMillan lives in sunny Chicago, Illinois. He works as a senior software engineer at LeapFrog Online. He uses Python to manage LeapFrog Online's ETL uh, data pipelining, as well as using it to build uh, web applications, services, and automated testing strategies. Active member of the open source community, maintains several packages like Fixture, WSGI, Intercept, Flickr, and helping out on Nose, Blogmaker, several others. Uh, he's a good friend and colleague uh, that he's talking about. Small Latin C with a with a, a few 
accent, and this is uh, Croatian. So it's it's commonly referred to in Croatian as a C with a hash at. You'll see here that it takes two bytes. But other encodings might use more than that, or not not two bytes at all. Who knows? Um, and Python out of the box supports over 100 different types of coding. But UTF-8 is just an extension of ASCII. So right here I made a chart of the first word Ivan and how each letter just maps two bytes. And, and this, is, this, is, this is how ASCII would map I, V, A, and N. ASCII, which you're probably familiar with, was created quite a long time ago as the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And it's pretty simple. Each character is one byte. There's 128 possibilities. So that means if we keep going, we, we uh, on the second word, we can only make it as far as the C with the hatchet. So I guess Croatia was not really a, important when they created ASCII. Um, that's the problem. And to back it up a little bit, the uh, built-in strings in Python 2 start with uh, the, the base string, and then it goes to the stir, which the stir type which inherits from that, and then the Unicode type. And here are some important methods that um, will probably make more sense as I go on a little bit, but just take note that the decode method on a stir object will turn that object into a Unicode object, and the encode method on a Unicode instance will turn that into a stir object. Does this really seem like a problem so far? I mean, we read in this, you see this, this file, we got a byte string. Um, well, I'm just going to show some kind of basic string calculations here. So if we take the length of it, it tells us 12. Let's give you a second to count that up. The width of spaces, that's not quite accurate. It's actually 11. And then we'll take a slice of the last character, and we get hex 87. But as I said earlier, that C with the hat check takes up two bytes. So that doesn't really seem like that might have been what we want, because we know that other encodings can use just a byte. So let me do this again in new code. I'll use the decode method on the UTF-8 string, and I'll, I'll get this uh, new object back, which is now of type new code. And if I calculate the length of that, then it gives me 11, which is, is, is pretty much what it is, including the space in the name. And if I take the last, the slice of the last character, then I see hex 0107, which kind of looks, from that representation, it looks like maybe that's the full C that I was looking for. So what is that object that we just got? It's a way to represent text without bytes. And Unicode is a specification that assigns a unique number, which they call code points, to each character of every language. It's not really every language in existence, but it's uh, pretty much all the major written languages, and that's quite a lot of characters. It supports over a million of these code points. So Unicode is the ideal. If ASCII, UTF-8, and these other byte strings are text, then Unicode is text mints. It is an abstract form of text. So it's just a concept. Here is uh, C with a hat check again, and you see it maps to hex 0107 in Unicode. But to save it to disk, you'll have to encode it into a byte encoding. And we've already seen the UTF-8 one, which consists of two bytes. But then the UTF-16 one consists of two different bytes. I've also put the ship JIS encoding in here, which is popular for Japanese, and that does it in a whole completely different set of two bytes. And this will go on and on. Yeah, UTF stands for Unicode Transformation Format, and starting with UTF-8 here, it's a variable byte representation. So that just means that it uses uh, either one byte to encode and, and you go up to two bytes or four bytes, depending on the uh, complexity of the character set. And this also means that it's backwards compatible with ASCII. So right above here, you see that uh, I created a new code object out of the capital letters A and B. I encoded that, and I just got A and B as you would normally expect it in ASCII. 
UTF-16 is also variable byte representation, but this one starts at two bytes and goes up to four bytes. So this means it's just, it's a little bit more optimized for um, more complicated character sets like Japanese, um, and of, of course that also means that it's gonna take up a little bit more memory, but on the other hand, it might be a little bit faster if you know that you're gonna work it entirely you know, in Japanese. But also take note that uh, this is UTF, so it stands for Unicode Transformation Format. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that you have to use UTF-16 or UTF-8 for a specific type of Unicode character. All Unicode is going to be encodable by any UTF variation. UTF-32 is completely fixed width, so that means it's every character is four bytes guaranteed, and that you know would maybe make it a little bit faster to parse, but we don't really care because computers are pretty fast already, and Python doesn't even support it. So I found this guy on the internet, um, uh, Ian Albert, and he decided he wanted to print the entire Unicode chart. That's a lot of characters, and it turned out that he had to print it pretty big, and he uh, had a pretty big file at the end of the day. So here he is, <laughs> <laughs> this is Unicode chart. And if you go to his website, he says that uh, Kiko starts from $20, and he's pretty sure they don't charge them for that, but you know, they think. And here they zoom 50% and 100%, and I'm not sure what, what character set this is, but it looks pretty cool. <laughs> so the decoding part happens mostly automatically, um, and this is really the point of confusion, I think. Um, a lot of third party modules are going to do this for you automatically. Python is also going to do this automatically. So I wanted to illustrate the magic behind that and just show you sort of sort of what's happening. So if we have our Unicode object from before, we open a file and try to write the Unicode object, uh, we get this error. Unicode code error at the blah blah blah. So I'm gonna rewrite that code to sort of show a little bit more clear what Python did to you behind the scenes. When you went to write the Unicode object, Python said, oh, I can't write Unicode, so I need to encode that. And it imported, you know, or it used the sys.getDefault encoding, and there's an error again. Hopefully you caught that. The default encoding for Python 2 is ASCII. So you might have been told that you can just reset it you know, you can put this in a site customized module which gets loaded when Python starts up. Unfortunately, that's a bad idea, and here's why. Your code will not work on other Python installations, so you might have something working on your machine, and when you uh, hire a new developer to work on your project, he will load it up, and you might have forgotten that he put this uh, encoding in there, and he says it doesn't work on his machine, and you say, but it works on my machine. So it doesn't work on mine, say, but it works on mine. And so it's just a bad idea. It's just, it's more trouble than it's worth. You're gonna have to put an FAQ on, on your on your site, you know, to kind of tell them all your users they, they have to accept this. So just don't do it. Instead, the solution is pretty simple. You start by decoding early, using Unicode everywhere, and decode late. By decoding early, I just mean decode to the Unicode object to uh, take your cert type and turn it into Unicode as soon as you see it. So here's a, a function you might be able to use. This, um, it takes a, any object in and it checks, first of all, if it's an instance of the base string, then we know it's a string. And then if it's not an instance of Unicode, we create a Unicode object and return it. And if you put this maybe at the top of all your files that start to work with text, then you could, uh, as you see here, you can take a, a Unicode object, get a Unicode object back, put in a stir object, you get that back, you put in an integer or anything else, you get that back on top. And by encode link, I just mean to encode into the stir type whenever you write this or print, which is the same as writing this. Um, and so 
to do that, you would just uh, open a file, you would write the Unicode object with this special encoded uh, argument, which, would, which had returned a stir type for it. There's a good shortcut uh, to this that you should use. It's in the codex module, which is part of the standard lib. And uh, if you read the, uh, if, if you open a file with codex.open, you get a new keyword argument called Tony. And if you read that in, you'll see that this, that the codex module have, has already turned that into a new code object for you. So which is exactly what I did earlier. And it works the same way by writing. You can write Unicode and it'll it knows you would code it in UTF-8. So you're gonna run into some problems. Of course, some third-party modules won't like it if you use Unicode everywhere. First thing you should do, of course, is a bug. Um, and then so, but you also see that some built-in modules aren't gonna work. The CSD module comes to mind, and uh, some solutions for that, uh, you'll have to do some kind of ugly wrappers. You'll have to momentarily code into UTF-8, do whatever you should do, then decode immediately. And the CSE documentation shows uh, a way to write a, a streaming wrapper around the file. Kind of sad that they have that there. Yeah. Sometimes at the beginning of files, you'll, you'll see a byte order mark, which is also referred to as the bomb. And this is essential for UTF-16, UTF-32 files, because since they're multi-byte, they can be in a little Indian or a big Indian, and it's this will call it byte order. Um, but the UTF-8 bomb is just like a signature, and it, it, it's sometimes there and sometimes not. It's, it, it's very common in, in Windows to have a, a UTF-8 bomb. <laughs> and, um, the, the bomb itself can be two, three, or four bytes long. So to detect it, you'll have to read like a four byte sample. And you can use the codex module and, and, and do some comparison against some constants that they have there to tell you what it is. Sometimes you do have to remove the bomb. And this part is a little bit tricky, um, so, so bear with me. Uh, decoding to UTF-16 removes it automatically but if it's present in UTF-8, it will not get removed automatically unless you're using the codec UTF-8 SIG. SIG stands for signature, and this is this has only been added in 2.5. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> there is no reliable way to get some code, unfortunately. The bomb obviously gives you a pretty damn good clue. The, sometimes there'll be a content type header uh, in our browser, and there's a char this third-party module called Charbet uh, character detect, um, and that's supposedly a port of Mozilla encoding, but I had some problems with that, um, and the problem I had actually worked in Mozilla, so I, I guess I should move on to that. Um, if you have to guess, then UTF-8 is always going to be your best guess. And so to summarize here, the Default coding sucks, and files might contain a bomb that you might have to remove. Um, not all Python 2 kernels support you to code, can't reliably get some coding. So to go through some solutions, just encode early, use Unicode everywhere, encode late, write some uh, annoying hacky wrappers for all these modules that don't like Unicode. And of course, always put Unicode in unit tests, because that's going to be the best way that you could exercise your modules using Unicode and the third-party modules that, that you use as well. When you uh, do need to guess, uh, UTF-8 is the best one, and you can use the bomb to, to make this guess, or you use chardet.detect, and chardet does do a lot of the, the really obvious kind of checks. You know, it'll, it'll look for the bomb and it'll be able to tell you what, what that is reliably. So, <clears throat> what changed in Python 3? Yay, they fixed Unicode. Uh, specifically, the, the stir type is a Unicode object. So there is no Unicode type anymore. And if you want to work with bytes, if, 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 if it really is binary data, not text, then you have a separate type called the bytes type. And they made an effort, of course, to support Unicode everywhere <coughs> and there's no more funky 
new single quote syntax that is actually a syntax error. You know? And the, uh, the built-in open is just like the codex out of when it takes an encoding argument. And default encoding is UTFA. Yay! And it uh, run out of time a little bit here, but the uh, one thing I do want to say about this is that the uh, it, it will try to guess your file encoding, and this is going to be the the one thing that is is not going to be fixed in Python 3. So you will still need to know what the encoding is because it can't always guess it on Mac OS X. I saw in Alpha that it has a lot of problems, um, and that this is almost at the end here. I just want to thank my employer, Lee Bagaman, for bringing me to Python and also for sponsoring Python. And I'll let you read this while we take questions. Thank you very much. So what's the support for the supplementary claims in Python 3? I'm sorry, the, the supplementary claims the one thing you did to the representation, but what's the support for that in Python 3? Um, you know, I'm not really sure if that's changed um, because, uh, I mean, I, as I understand it, those claims are still supported in Python 2, so I guess I don't really have an answer. I think I can answer. Okay, so first of all, uh, Python does vaguely support 32-bit uh, characters. There's a bigger option for, for that. And second of all, Python has its head in the sand about uh, the serving pairs. So you're going to have the same problem as you have with UTF-8, where it's a double string, where you say the length of, of the thing is 12. It's not going to understand those pairs. And uh, Python 3000 does not change that. Uh, you know, just assumes that 65,000 characters are good enough for anything. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, what about string literals inside your Python code that would be Unicode? How does that work? Uh, you mean how does it work now? How does it work and how will it work, I guess? Oh, uh, and I assume you mean in, in Python 3? In Python 2 or 3, like if you have a string literal and you don't want to escape it during this tab in your code, how does the interpreter know what encoding your text editor prefers? Oh, uh, okay, good question, yeah. Um, what you will need to do for string literals that are non ASCII is you'll have to put uh, um, at the top of your file, you'll have to put like uh, a hash to go for a comment, and you'll have to say uh, encoding equals UTFA or something else. And there's a couple different formats for that. They, they use the Gmax, or they support the Gmax one as well, because encoding is our Do you know if there's any improvements in uh, trying to use Unicode file names in the file system with Python 3000? Because a lot of the issues I've seen have been related to trying to open a file with a uh, shift file. Right. And I think a lot of that has been problems with the built-in function not supporting Unicode. So um, I haven't tried it, but I imagine since they made everything supporting Unicode, that they might have addressed that. Other questions? Sure. Well, maybe just a short remark. I mean, I totally agree with every, everything you said, but uh, for people that get bitten by these kind of issues, you're able to put your site customized anywhere with the Python path. So, I mean, if you just put it into your project and override it that way, it should work. So. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely going to work. But um, it's, it's evil, I agree. With it. Yeah, it, it's, it's, if you need to do it, it's sometimes a really easy way to fix problems. And maybe you don't, you're not interested in distributing your module, you know, and like maybe you put a post note on your computer that says you always did it, and you won't forget it. Uh, so in Pi3K, will uh, we be able to use Unicode names for like uh, variable names and function names and stuff? You will, yes. Yeah, it, it'll be, um, yeah, that's what we actually just found that out when we go to talk. Can you explain the options when I've got some Unicode text I'm writing to an ASCII file for automatically converting, ignoring the funny characters that don't exist in standard ASCII? What are my options? Um, when you say writing to an ASCII file, what, what do you mean by that? Plain ASCII. So, um, 
was encoding some data for a sat nav file that can only display letters A to Z. Um, I understand Codex gives some automatic functions you can ignore stuff and do. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. So you could say, uh, uh, stir, like, you could, or you'd have your Unicode object, and you could say, dot encode, and then ATI, and then you could give it uh, another option, another argument that it, that it says replace, and that would replace any unknown characters with a question mark. And there's a couple of different ways to do that as well, somewhere in the documentation. Other questions? All right, come on, my fellow.